Hey everyone, thank you so much for being here today. We're gonna unpack one mega roll-up or a million roll-ups. Um, today we have Shuyo from Mega ETH, Azim from Morph, Ben from Starkware, and Maureen from Optimism. Um, I'm just gonna get us started off like, I guess, I guess a little bit of background. Um, you know, since the roll-up centric roadmap came out in 2020, we've seen you know hundreds if not thousands of roll-ups just proliferating across the space. Some you know EVM just additional execution points for EVM specific apps. Additional roll-ups that are more so like alt VM or next gen VM, in addition to a bunch of you know app specific roll-ups. Um, I haven't really we haven't really quite found what the winner is. If there's going to be one, if there's going to be many, and I'm just going to get us started off with like a really straight to the point question. What do we think? One roll-up or a bunch of roll-ups? If there is one roll-up, do we think it's technically feasible to bring all of the world's users on chain um, in one state machine? Um, Shuyao, let's let's get started with you. I say, oh, it works. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't think you can have like one roll-up that um, that houses the world's transaction. Uh, but I think we need to make that one roll-up, whatever it is, to be uh, as powerful uh, as possible. Um, to enable uh, compute intense application to co-locate. So, I mean, to answer your question, obviously not one or one, but we need lots of uh, really powerful um, blockchains. So yeah, I'm gonna start this by saying I'm the least technical person on my founding team. Actually, I think I'm the least technical person. I'm the least technical. Oh, There's God. no way. But the thing uh, is, our moderator yeah. asked us a bunch of pretty technical questions. I'm yes. literally waiting on my telegram that my CTO can send an answer <laughs> back to me. So you see me checking my phone, it's really like I'm too mid curve for this panel. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to at all. I apologize. Uh, uh, so in talking to my CTO, I was actually curious about this myself. And because of these distinct user scenarios, it's definitely not possible on cost security and scalability. And so according to him, this, this is definitely not something that's going to happen. Um, yeah, so I think thinking, at least thinking about the L2 as being able to house you know, the world's transactions is at least you know, an interesting thought experiment. Um, and, it, and it takes you down the path of, you know, the L2 needs to be as scalable as possible. Um, so, you know, we believe that's obviously with Stark's, Stark's scale logarithmically with the more transaction data. So, I mean, you definitely need to build your stack. I mean, we think that you need to build your stack in that direction of one rollup um, while still opening the door for, you know, different ways to enable app chains. Yeah, I mean, I think plus one to what we said, right? I think we agree there isn't going to be a single roll-up. We've already seen right now with the market that there is a need for multiple roll-up and different types of roll-up. It's sort of how do you enable all these use cases um, to easily build and then interact with one another, both um, within the same stack and across different stacks, I would think. All right, so I think we all agree probably multiple roll-ups, not exactly sure how many, um, but obviously each roll-up is gonna have like a different uh, flavor, um, some of which are general purpose, something like optimism, and others of which are more so um, focused on a specific sector, like a you know, consumer for Morph. Um, curious to think, see how you guys think about that, and like what might be the winning strategy um, as a roll-up? Why do you choose to go more so to the general purpose route, or more so specific to a, um, particular ecosystem or a particular you know, type of application. Um, feel free, anyone can get us started. Maybe Ben, you wanna get us started with that question? Sure, um, you know, as you, if you're an app and you're looking at the landscape of everything, um, you know, you really need to understand if you need composability with other smart contracts on chain. Um, if you do, um, and you also care about things like economic security guarantees of the base layer, you're probably gonna deploy it to you know, a big L2. Um, if you don't need composability quite as much, then you're looking at an app chain. Um, you can also get other different trade-offs like, you know, extremely high throughput, extremely low transaction um, price. You know, you have a lot more control over the knobs of your app chain uh, if you go the L3 route. Maybe Shu Yao, um, curious about um, about your chain or. You're, I'm assuming you're creating an L2, is that correct? Maggie, it's gonna be an L2? Yes, well, we, we yes, we are uh, using Ethereum security, yes. Okay, great, um, so I'm just curious, like, <laughs> Um, just curious, I know performance, right, and that you're talking about having really high performance environment. Are you thinking of focusing on a specific type of use case or more so just enabling like any type of use case um, and, and why would you do one or the other? Yeah, so um, I actually, um, I, I think about how I got into crypto in 2017 uh, and I, I think actually everyone wonders like, 
the question of why blockchain, right? Uh, and I think the core tenet to my thesis is uh, interoperability and having application to co-locate, to explore capital efficiency, and create new marketplace. So with that interoperability thesis as in mind, I actually don't think you need application that just live on their own single chain and doesn't have to be interacted with other applications. I think that's Web 2 applications. So if you want to be qualified for Web 3 applications, um, you need to interact with others. So um, that's why we're building a general purpose rollup uh, that is extremely powerful. Uh, we call ourselves the first real-time blockchain uh, because we have extremely low latency, so some millisecond. Um, in comparison, right, Solana has 400 millisecond. And with our blockchain, you can actually have um, a lot of like compute intense um, um, consumer applications. Well, this, the consumer guy is sitting next to me, so I think you have to answer this question afterwards. Um, and then, uh, so that gives you the web to experiences, right, without losing the Web3 interoperability. And, oh, did you want to? No, I was just gonna disagree a tiny bit on a point that, um, that uh, what doesn't constitute Web2, Web3 um, Web would be automatically Web2. Things like, for example, autonomous worlds, I think, have like app chains that has a very um, direct thesis as to why it should be a Web3 application and use case. And I think that's a very, um, yeah, interesting use case for Web3 applications, right? Um, that doesn't need to be a general purpose rollup, for example. But the synergy you can explore, for example, with a fully on-chain game. So there's a team called Biome. They're building a um, fully on-chain Minecraft. And yes, it can exist in their own environment. But if you put it in a general purpose chain, that autonomous world can interact with a lot of primitives that is equally in the same general purpose rollup, right? So think about, like, there's a random meme coin that gets launched in the, in the rollup. And that meme coin, uh, perhaps some of them enter the autonomous world and someone start hoarding I don't know, red hat, uh, and then somehow this meme code just became really popular and you can start a, I don't know, red hat bank in the autonomous world. So uh, I think, and that's really where you create magic uh, and imagination when you have applications co-locate. Yeah, similarly, we went general purpose because it'd be easier for the smart contract protocols to interact with each other as opposed to different rollups on it. And gaming was one of the specific ones where we looked, DeFi Infra could be used for in-game tokens or NFTs using DEXs and NFT marketplaces as opposed to doing it a different way. And so we thought it would just make a more diverse ecosystem that way. So I guess, um yeah, the benefits of obviously sharing a chain are like the you know real time atomic composability, um, but at the same time you have more expressivity when you're creating an app chain. So I'm curious, like I know that for for Starkware and for Optimism, you're looking into you know L2 and L3 ecosystems of which you know you can choose either being deployed directly to the L2 and taking advantage of the you know atomic composability, or going your own way and you know creating your own rollup. Um, I'm curious what do you think is an app then that would be best suited for an app chain environment or an L3 as opposed to deploying as a smart contract? Um, Maureen, we can start with you. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I think, as you said, right, it's kind of like the expressivity, like what you're looking for. There's um, certain use cases that just want to be a smart contract on an existing like general purpose chain. Um, there's others that want capabilities such as, for example, utilizing their token as the gas token, in which case um, that can be well suited for an L2 or even an L3 if they're more cost conscious and want to compose more with the um, L2 in question, with the L2 in question. So I think it's um, sort of like security and cost trade-offs and the level of like customization you're, you're looking for. So I would agree with um, what you said earlier. We think autonomous worlds are interesting as an L3. Um, you can almost maybe even think of it like a state channel uh, in which it kind of writes the, the, final, the final state to the chain um, at the end of the game. Um, and there's obviously merit to it being on the actual L2 as well. But um, you know, different games have different use cases. There's some use cases that have come out recently where you know, people need different verification use cases. Um, so you can think of like an L3 that writes its, um, its state diff to, uh, to Celestia as well as the proof. And then the client can actually run the verifier and be convinced of the state transition himself. Um, so there's, you know, there's a lot of actual different like software architectural use cases that you can do with app chains. 
Um, Shuya, I'm going to call upon you again. Um, <laughs> I, I know you mentioned, like, obviously the benefits of having that atomic composability, like, you know, an autonomous world could then, someone could be in that environment and then go easily and get a meme coin and pull it back in. But what do you see as the potential limitations to this? Like, at a certain point, like, I understand that Mega ETH is really going for performance, but is there a world in which you just really have to have an app chain from your perspective in which it's not possible to all fit it in one environment? Sounds like skill issue to me. <laughs> Uh, so, um, I think, I mean, with like DA solutions like Celestia, right, you're in, uh, empowering um, general purpose row up like uh, Mega East to be fast and, and cheap. And I think in the future, uh, the technology will get even more modular, uh, even more granular. Uh, for example, we have no specialization, which my head of growth uh, just talked to you guys about. So I think the blockchain performance will only get better and better, and that allows us to have uh, application uh, that utilize the block space because I, I think fundamentally right now we have more block space than applications. Uh, I, I appreciate everybody discussing, worrying about a future where we run out of block space, uh, but I do think right now uh, we have to worry about not having use cases. Uh, I think in, to answer your, your question more directly, uh, we actually just do not see a world of app chain. Uh, we think if the general purpose chain is powerful enough, then application must co-locate together. Interesting. So I see we kind of have a divide here um, from different teams. Um, we'll see. We'll see what happens over time. But I guess realistically, you know, we're all we're all building in different directions. And um, the uh, from the user's perspective, they have so many different chains, whether it be app chains or general purpose chains to choose from. There might be an application they want, um, you know, on Optimism. Another one they want on Mega ETH. Um, and they're going to have to all be connected, right? Um, so I'm curious to get your take. Like, obviously now we have bridges. We're working on shared sequencers, and in the you know the farther future, there's going to be the abstraction networks where the user doesn't necessarily know what route was taken, just that it was the best path. Um, but this could introduce some you know trust assumptions in using a bridge that you know isn't a fully validating bridge or whatnot. Um, I'm curious. Do you guys think it's acceptable to enter into additional trust assumptions to be able to get users between all of these chains? Um, and, and if not, why? Does that make sense? I can reword that because I think I kind of went a little convoluted direction. But um, you want to get started, Maureen? Yeah, yeah. No, I think there's like certain solutions that are coming up, like interop, right? In the more like intent based interop. I mean, we're um, at Optimism building uh, native interop, but that's going to be able to be leveraged by like relayers. Um, using, yeah, an intent-based system. And so there, the trust assumptions are, especially not within the native interop, minimized. So you do, I mean, in the future, there will be a world, right, where the um, trust assumptions of the users um, aren't the ones that they are today with certain, like, bridging mechanisms. So I think it will become, yeah, quite interesting without the users' funds being at risk and more focusing, like, what is the ultimate intent of the user? And they'll never actually see the bridge or have to bridge. Um, and it will be rather like the relayer that takes the risk. And so there will be just a, a pricing to that. I think it's definitely a valid question. Um, I mean, anytime you're injecting any type of trust into these systems, it seems like it should be a bad thing, right? They're, we're supposed to be trustless um, in blockchain. So yeah, so for Stark, where, uh, for StarkNet specifically, we prove the consumption and the writing to our, our messaging queue. So there's no, there's no trust assumptions in the system. It's a trustless bridge. Um, so I think, I think these solutions will pop up. I think they're inevitable, but I think it's a, a valid question as to, you know, what are we really doing here? And maybe just like one more thing there. There's like the users are already, um, there is trust assumptions, right? Like they're connecting with a wallet with an RPC provider. Like everybody's not running their own node at home. So they're already willing to make these compromises. Um, it's just how do you like, reduce them um, and reduce the security risk vectors, I think. I guess from my perspective, it's like, um, it's more so on the safety side of things. Like I think that we can, the, the way I see like what the mega roll up might be, it might not be like one singular chain um, that is the mega roll up, but it's that uh, these ecosystems of chains, so whether they be um, the Ethereum ecosystem or the Celestia ecosystem, if they're you know, using a shared consensus and DA layer, they're able to have you know trust minimized composability um, using shared sequencers or using um, just you know proof aggregation networks or whatnot. So that to me, I think that 
if you stay within a certain ecosystem in that way, um, you're able to have that feeling of truly one mega rollup that doesn't have the additional trust assumption. Um, obviously, that's a little bit you know farther in the future, um, but but curious, how do you guys like think about that? Like, do you think that a mega rollup would be just these kind of zones of sovereignty, or would they extend to you know potentially these order flow abstraction networks that go between DA layers? If that makes sense. Um, Sure, yeah, I guess I'll start with you. Um, <clears throat> I feel like, um, like I think if we're really successful as an uh, as a, as industry, where um, there are so many people using crypto every day, so many interesting um, use cases, I, I do think w what you're envisioning. Um, how different um, parts let's of, of blockchain interact with each other. Um, so I think answer is yes, I see that. Um, the specific solution, I'm not sure, to be honest. I feel like um, the topic us as an industry have been discussing every single year actually is very different. And oftentimes, there's no correct answer. I, I think shared sequencing is extremely uh, popular these days. Uh, at Mega East, we actually take a very different approach uh, to share sequencing, which means we actually don't believe in shared sequencing. Uh, what we're doing is uh, rotating centralized sequencer. So at any one moment, we just have one centralized sequencer. That's how we ensure the performance is to the moon. Um, but then there is a way to rotate the, uh, the sequencer that's being used at the moment. So I mean, you can criticize uh, different approaches. I think uh, right now, it's really hard uh, for me to think about which one is going to win. And I think different application or different blockchain ecosystems some have different preference for security and decentralization. What we need to do even for the blockchain ecosystem is to enable them to express different uh, approaches. Uh, for example, I personally don't think that layer two needs to be as decentralized as layer one, right? Like that's layer one's job to be decentralized. Why are you replicating layer one's job? You should just use what other uh, blockchains have done really well, right? Use Celestia as your data availability layer. Shout out to Celestia. Uh, and don't re reinvent the wheel. So uh, I hope that answers your question. Um, sure. Anyone else want to want to take that? Yes. Uh, well, I guess one other thing I'll mention is, um, you know, in the not too distant future, we'll be uh, committing to Bitcoin as well. Um, so you know, there's actually you can maybe even think of it like different zones of sovereignty within the same uh, general purpose L2 rollup, and then we'll also have volition as well. So kind of up to the to, up to the developer, up to the user where they feel they want to, you know, get sovereign. Maureen, that's it. Yeah, no, I think everything has been shared. In terms of shared sequencing, I think that's um, quite interesting. I think as we see uh, many different L2s utilizing the same um, rollup as a service providers, we're obviously going to see some that are going to want to use shared sequencing, and um, that's going to enable atomic transaction around separate rollups, so that's going to be interesting. Um, in terms of like what's going to win, I don't think there's going to be one winner um, in all of this. I think there's a world where you need a super beefy sequencer. There's a world where you need an app chain, um, and I think this is what the market is showing that they want. So I think everybody's going to win. <laughs> Very optimistic. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, we're all going to win. Um, yeah, I like to think that as well. I think it, it is really interesting, right? Like everybody has a totally different approach, and there's no one size fits all solution for everybody. So my, my feeling is a million roll ups more than one mega roll up. Um, one I, mega roll-up among a thousand roll-ups. Kind of, yeah. It'll, it'll, hopefully, at the end of the day, it will be totally abstracted to the point where you don't, you don't even know what you're mm. doing, just that you're composing in a trust-minimized way. Um, I want to dive a little deeper, I guess, into what these independent networks will look like. So within that, okay, so we have like the whole larger thing, you know, some of which will have trust-minimized composability, some of which will have some points of trust, um, but maybe these ecosystems, like, for example, Morph, focusing on consumer, will have, like, a consumer experience, like, at the smart contract platform uh, level. So, yeah, I just wanted to dive in a little bit more into Morph, Azeem. I know we haven't chatted a lot about, like, your approach to consumer within, like, a, a sovereign environment. So curious why you went in that direction. So we went with trying to go for general purpose, uh, having smart contracts deployed to the L2 for composability and interoperability. Uh, but <clears throat> we're going with, I'm actually reading this, 
Uh, Ethereum for DA, ZKPs with optimistic rollups uh, right now, but one of the things that we thought about or looked at for like apps that might need better cost or performance is going to be being able to use a different DA for an L3 with them. And it's one of the things like have not chatted enough with Celestia, I see Nick in the crowd, uh, but been chatting with Avail and Eigen about what that would look like in the future when we get to the point that we can do that. Got you. So, so you're also, I guess, having the L2s as well as enabling an L3 ecosystem in the future. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Got yeah. you. So three, three for four are going in that direction. Um, Shuya, I'm going to pick on you again one more time. Um, I, I know you're just going in a different direction, so I find it really fascinating. I, I'm curious, like, from the technical perspective, like, how are you going to enable um, this, you know, true scale on, on one rollup? Yeah, so, uh, oh, oh, great. Yeah. By the way, uh, <clears throat> apology for my voice, um, but we're throwing another party tonight. If you want to come to <laughs> Mega Rave, uh, <laughs> we have a good DJ from Berkheim. So, um, um, yeah, dude, that's hard to get them, um, and you might get a chance to win the hat too. So, <laughs> um, so the que yeah, the question was uh, how yeah, what what do we do? So. Um, Anyone read this paper from a uh, blog from Vitalik in 2021? Uh, it's called Endgame. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, in the Endgame, uh, you know, dude wrote this in 2021, right, many years ago. He said the likely Endgame of scaling Ethereum, uh, one of the potential, well, to one of the two possible Endgame is to have a blockchain, a mega rollup that has a relatively centralized block production and very decentralized block validation. And that's exactly what Mega ETH does. So our um, block production, which is our sequencer, is extremely beefy. We've done a lot of optimization. We rewrote the entire state try uh, to make sure that it's extremely performant. And we have extremely decentralized and lightweight validating node to ensure the security. And obviously, we're using Ethereum um, security guarantee. We have forced exit. Um, and also, uh, and then uh, in terms of data availability, uh, we're exploring all options. Um, and, and so these, uh, as a together, is called node specialization. So rather than having one set of nodes that does all the activities as most layer one blockchains and a lot of the layer twos, we have different nodes that specialize in the things that they're really good at. So uh, our secret sauce is actually uh, not so inventive as what we would claim. Uh, actually, Vitalik wrote about this many years ago. Uh, and I think the reason that not a lot of people have actually built it uh, is actually a skill issue. Uh, so my co-founders are extremely cracked. Uh, they studied um, low, latest, uh, low latency data center compute at Stanford, PhD, and dis a distributed system at MIT uh, for many years. So uh, I think we saw the vision, and we actually are making it happen. So, so interesting. So are you saying that these validating nodes are going to be lightweight, like in, in the same sense that like a Celestia light node is lightweight, so more people can validate and then just is yeah, so our layer two full nodes are extremely lightweight. So we decoupled the execution from the layer two full node. Interesting. Um, yeah, I definitely need to dive into your docs more. Um, thank you for going in, into that detail. Um, it is really curious to see, you know, all teams going in different directions, and so I appreciate like the level of detail that you give. Um, I'm going to zoom out a little bit now and be a little bit less technical. Um, I, I've heard lately about this notion of enshrining certain core infrastructure into a protocol, like for example, Barachain, right? They're having their like Barachain native DEX or their Barachain native like lending platform. Um, and I think I've heard whispers throughout the ecosystem. We're probably going to see more of this um, in the future, as opposed to just having like a fully permissionless general purpose execution environment. So kind of helping the ecosystem become a little bit more um, uh, specific in what they're trying to offer. I'm curious if any of your teams have thought about doing something like this, like enshrining apps at the protocol layer, um, and if so, uh, why, and, and if not, why not? Um, does anyone want to get started? So, since we're still in testnet, <clears throat> it was something we did consider. We ended up shying away from it, though, because we thought while it might be better in the short term for having everyone know exactly where to go for things, <clears throat> we thought it would feel a little bit monopolistic because other people who would want to then launch would be in a really bad position to be able to compete with the native things that we had enshrined. And so we didn't want to set a scenario where that would happen. I guess also, you know, Optimism and Starkware are, are not doing this approach. Um, do you see any um, benefits or perhaps drawbacks to, to potentially going in that direction in the future? 
Um, yeah, no, I mean, OP Mainnet, the network, obviously didn't make this decision. Um, Optimism providing the OP stack also does not make this decision. Um, we're even like very worry, weary of including like certain pre-compile or pre-deploys because we're even thinking about like not wanting to create state bloat um, that some network, networks might not want, right? So it's up to the chains um, that deploy to, to, to make those decisions if they, they want it or not. So at the tech stack level, we don't want to impose anything like that. Yeah, same for us. Um, you know, we don't want to introduce any type of complication into the protocol layer that, that doesn't need to be there. You know, the benefit of it being general purpose is that anyone can then go deploy these things. And it, it does sound like a good use case for an app chain at the end of the day. You know, if, if that's something that they'd like to enshrine, that's a perfect reason to have an app chain. Um, okay, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm just... Another Kawhi contrarian Hope. take? Who, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, we actually have co-located um, Oracle for Mega East. And the reason is we're here to make Ethereum great again and beat all the other alt layer one. So, uh, and the reason is we have a rotating centralized sequencer. So when you co-locate the Oracle with a centralized sequencer, you can do magical things like arbitrages that no one else can do. And this is really a 10x experiences for a blockchain network, um, oh, well, like similar to, um, to a Web2 um, services. So that's, that's what I think uh, the, the different things that, we, that we're doing. Yeah, because the benefits is very obvious um, to any um, asset to asset transfer uh, primitives on Mega ETH. So basically, oh, you go ahead. How, how does the co-location with the sequencer facilitate that? What? Sorry? Uh, how does the co-location of the Oracle with the sequencer facilitate that? I mean, you'll still have Oracle data yeah, on the... Yeah, but it's co-located, right? It's extremely fast, so you can do arbitrages. Because everything we do is low latency, which is why we call ourselves the first real-time blockchain. Because we get you get first-time money market, first-time DEXs, um, and then like if you get liquidation, it's actually micro-liquidation. You don't get like a sudden liquidation. Um, because the round trip for a transaction is extremely fast. But I guess co-located means that like it's not enshrined in the protocol, right? Like you're just running it out of the, yeah, okay, okay. okay. Well, like, so. Yeah, we, we, we struggle, we're like, is this enshrining? Because like in the Ethereum world, like enshrining like it can be bare quite- metal server. Yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah, Sarah, so thanks for the, the correction. Yeah. All right, I've actually run out of my questions. Um, we've gone pretty quickly. Is there anything you guys want to talk about? Um, I can go one by one. If there's kind of an overall overarching theme, what do we think? One roll up, a million roll ups. Um, how, how do we feel after all these talk? All, uh, after all this talk, Maureen, I'll let you finish okay, up. Okay. Well, I think my position is is a bit clearer. I mean, again, I will just say, also not just like for like public blockchains, right? But private blockchains. Ideally, there is a future also where private blockchains are needed. Um, or already already is and are and so I think we're they're clearly not going to like governments are going to want blockchain and ideally that leads to like efficiency hopefully not CBDC but like other types of more efficient private blockchains and they're not going to want like one um, like a public blockchain where they don't control the sequencer so even just from that aspect right I think you see that um, there's there's a need for like many different types of blockchains to meet the different types of applications there is and I think the problem even if like super beefy and fast with a general purpose chain it doesn't have like the customizability to meet the need of, of certain use cases right um, I mean I'm not sure what sort of like block time you're, you're looking for but I'm maybe perhaps like games are looking for something even more like even better or certain use cases will always want more and are willing to make trade-offs on other things that like for general purpose you wouldn't want so um, yeah, that's a bit my thoughts on that. Yeah, so at the end of the day, app chains are cool, <laughs> in my opinion. Um, and, you know, we believe that you need to have the general purpose L2 be as performant and have as performant as a stack as possible so you can, you know, employ those things um, at the app chain layer at some point. Um, I think it's also, you know, a, a switch to app chains, but in a similar vein is uh, proving snarks on Starks. So you can do things that aren't even app chains, but that are still provable on the, on the general purpose L2. So there's a lot of different use cases that we want to enable um, from the general purpose L2 you know, to different layers. I have <clears throat> two sort of spicy takes. Uh, one is that I know we're constantly talking about how 
only more infra gets funded, and I actually think more infra does need to get funded uh, because we're not at the place where we have an understanding of how things actually will end up going with this. And the other thing is, is the infighting that I end up seeing within Ethereum actually like is interesting because it reminds me of AOL because I'm old. <laughs> and, and I think about how AOL commanded the majority of the market before and how there are many people who still assume like Ethereum has fully won already when I do look at how like Aptos and Sui or like when Mega ETH came out, although you guys are EVM, uh, that it seems like there's going to be different chains for different things and that what my guess is is that interoperability and composability end up working the right way between them over time where things are abstracted away and there will definitely be like app specific chains but they might be on completely different blockchains as well. I think like oftentimes we're in this uh, echo chamber where everyone talks as if like ETH has already won forever and I do my best to go out to other ecosystems and like one of the people who was not fading Solana last year and then like seeing what they've done and ETH people will still say like, oh, well, it's just meme coins, but like they've also done deals with Visa. And so when I look around, uh, it's sort of looking at that. Final spicy take. I was gonna say Mega <laughs> ETH is the real Solana. But, uh, <laughs> it's more performant and more secure and really exploiting the limit of hardware. Um, yeah, I, I think I, I respect honestly what um, optimism has done for our industry uh, a lot. I think uh, what Mega East is doing can we cannot do what we do with optimism. Uh, we are using optimistic consensus, uh, cons as consensus note, right? Like so, me here talking about Mega East doesn't mean like other roll up is is anything worse. I think everybody has done things really good um, so that we can uh, stand on the, on the shoulder of, of giant. Uh, I really love what Starkware does as well. Uh, we also think ZK is the future, no offense, I feel like no optimism. You guys are also introducing ZK, but you got my point. Um, I think all of this like very interesting innovation and different direction uh, is just pushing everyone uh, to think further about how to onboard applications. Um, like, Marine, when you were talking about the fully on-chain game, I got really excited because I think this is a truly a crypto native use case that it would be great if it's an app chain, it would be great if it's on Mega ETH. Like, honestly, it doesn't matter as long as like, you know, like Web2, like we onboard more people to the fantastic world that we live in. We're obviously very opinionated uh, on the, um, the, mega, um, the, the mega chain, uh, mega ETH chain. Uh, but I think what we're doing as R&D in our ecosystem, we're hoping that we can give back to all of you, right? What we're doing on our sequencer, I hope we can empower everyone else as well. So like it's really not a black and white uh, difference as every single technology component can, can help each other. Uh, I think lastly, like uh, I love what you guys are doing on the consumer focus. Uh, I think I'd love to hear uh, more about what your lesson learned in maybe optimizing the wallet experience. How do you empower people to buy an, uh, on and off ramp crypto a lot more easily? Uh, how can I not use a spreadsheet to track my like seed phrase and etc. Um, so and eventually I think a lot of people here were just like make Ethereum great again, right? So we're all very much on the same mission. Thank you so much everyone. Um, we'd love to meet back in a year and see where we are um, and see if our opinions have changed or whatnot. But it was really great and thank you for all of your spicy takes and um, yeah thank you the audience as well. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.